Um, how much neuroscience do you think will make these issues more tractable? Well, I think issues about the nature of morality, or at least about the basic platform that allows for the development in humans of specific kind of moral codes and so forth, and also for the development of conscious conscience um, as the child acquires the social practices of, of the group and as the child adopts certain figures as models and as authorities, I think understanding that will turn out to be, turn out to be absolutely critical. Um, but there are obviously other features that are important in, in, in understanding some of the really horrendous things that happen. Um, Walter Sinnott Armstrong, for example, is very interested in the brain-based nature of, of psychopaths and what the difference is between the brains of those who really are psychopaths in the full sense. And I mean, not just, you know, when we talk about somebody we don't like as a psychopath, but someone who really does measure as a psychopath on the Robert Hare scale. Um, what's different about these people and then to also further d the discussion about the nature of our responsibility to them and what we do with them in the event that they are violent. Owen? The, um, the question about, um, one way to put it, my sympathy with uh, the work that Patty does and then, uh, but bring it in more broadly, there is this question about um, how much can explanatory work in the brain do? And I think uh, since we know so little about the brain, uh, the kind of work about the way Patty puts it is about thinking as the brain, the brain, our evolved brains, as the natural platform upon which everything happens. And this just came out in the comments that Richard made a little while ago. I mean, genes build brains in certain ways, which are, we'll suppose, the universal platform on which we do all the different social things we do, including have uh, religious and spiritual traditions. But obviously neuroscience won't be enough just for the following simple reason. We are all thrust into very complex social ecologies with antecedent histories that have cer set out certain conditions of our membership into the particular ecologies that we grow up in. This is again related to the point that we're born into um, you know, cultural traditions which uh, uh, tell us what kind of person we're going to be normatively and possibly if there are religions in the vicinity, what kind of person we ought to end up. So I think this is a, it's a nice moment in, in thinking about the sort of natural history and sociology of religion where all the human sciences, I mean after all we're talking not just about brain science being new but you think about uh, uh, Geisteswissenschaften, you know, the sciences of the spirit you think these are all late 19th century developments, so we're talking about 120 years worth of, well, Darwin is whatever, 150 years ago now, and then we have the explosion of, uh, we have anthropology, sociology, psychology. I mean, some people say preposterously, right? Psychology begins in 1879 in Leipzig. Well, you know, it depends on what you call what Socrates was doing. But, but clearly, there's something, and so what are we seeing now? We're seeing the possibility of Geisteswissenschaften without the Geist, where there's no longer, we're not going to think that this is um, uh, soul, you know, soul substance or uh, some kind of immaterial thing. It's got it's to be mediated by the brain. Um, but I think when we think about normativity, I'll end with this, we need to think about the fact that brains are doing something in social environments that have a history. It'd be nice to think that religions and ethical traditions are all the right solution to what the ecology calls for. But there's no reason to think that for familiar reasons when you have to worry about the fact that there are power relations involved, there are antecedent um, uh, attitudes about um, uh, how I want the, how the people who are there it, previously, these are worries that Foucault and Nietzsche and people like that make us worry about. For every um, ethical or spiritual tradition that has certain adaptive functions, it may also be that they were set up in the, um, uh, for the good of certain self-interested parties antecedently. So I, I don't think brain science will be nearly enough, but we sure need uh, 
what it can teach us. Well, no, no, give a specific example. I was only in and out for Miles' talk, so I didn't hear all of it, but I have read some of your work, and I do know that you said somewhere that face recognition is not about prejudice, it's about unfamiliarity. That seemed to me to be immensely important, and you quoted some neuroscience there. You looked at the, the, the experiments that people in, in the States, I'm thinking about Mazarin Banerjee or, 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 or Liz Phelps have done, and that was an extraordinarily um, useful technique in which you could be, you, you, tweet, which you were brought face to face with a word that you thought meant something you didn't know. I mean, be, the, the prejudice, and it was just unfamiliarity, I mean, just unfamiliarity. But do you see what I'm getting at in terms of the, the importance of injecting the neuroscience into these things. And let, me, let me give you a... because otherwise you won't get onto the table. Right. Um, <laughs> well, well, I'm a social psychologist, not a neuroscientist, but I'm a social psychologist who's collaborating with some neuroscientists. But I, I think there is currently uh, a, a tendency to oversell neuroscience, left, right, and centre. <laughs> uh, and I think it will tell us lots of interesting things, but I think it's very hard to imagine that it will be the solution to this, this particular problem or, or a number of other ones. But what has been great about this meeting is, is people coming together with, with such very different perspectives. I mean, that's the way to address a question like this. And neuroscience undoubtedly has some of the answers and social psychology, anthropology and all the rest have, have lots of the other answers too. Uh, thank you. Richard, did you have anything on that? No, I won't say anything about that. Uh, uh, um, I mean, I, I do recommend Sam Harris's new book, um, the, the Moral Landscape. Um, it, it really surprised me, but, but um, uh, go. Let me ask you another question then. Um, when I was talking to Julian yesterday, I, I was making the point that I, th we were talking about the genesis of this latest round of science versus religion, new atheism, and so on and so forth. And I said, and this is to you, Richard, I, I said that I thought one of the genesis for it was possibly 9-11 having read what you wrote and Sam wrote, and, and you, you thought not, you thought it went back further in? No, I don't. I think there's been a, uh, a huge movement um, towards atheism before 9-11. Um, so I think that was a, a catalyst for popular enthusiasm, but I, I think there's been a growing questioning of, of the role of religion. I think Richard's point, points about faith were exactly correct. Um, there were atheists um, promoting atheism well before 9-11. Peter Singer was a prominent atheist in, in the 80s and 90s. So I think it's really come to popular attention since then. But I think it's really a, uh, the questions that Richard is now raising very popularly have been obvious logical questions that anyone who has reflected on these issues has, has also um, come to. And I think what's changed is that people have been more prepared to stand up and be politically active uh, in a way that wasn't present before 9-11. So there's a greater political activism of, of atheism. But I think those, I mean, I wrote a paper in 94 on called Two Worlds Apart, the, the distinction between religion and ethics. And I said, ethics is like science and religious, religion is different because it's based on faith. I had more reprint requests for that article than I've had for anyone, but that was back in 1994. So I, I think it's important to recognise that, that this isn't just a, a post 9-11 response. Yeah, I think, I think I was just making the point that the, the, the audiences seem to respond very differently, whether one is here or whether it's in the States. Uh, one, of the, one of the meetings that we did, the, the second Beyond Belief was called, uh, the third one was called Candles in the Dark. Um, the reference being to Carl Sagan's reference to science as a, as a candle in the dark. And one, I, I asked people to come with some sort of a solution or perceived solution to this issue. Um, do you have anything that you would like to suggest? Okay, well, I, I mean, I just want to, to return to the first question, how much will neuroscience offer us? And I want to put this in context again. Um, very important thinkers have, have called this our final century. Martin Rees put our mm -hmm. chance of surviving at 50%, Richard Posner, Stephen Hawking, and so on. The world is fundamentally different today, and our limitations and the problems that Richard described have much greater significance. So it may be that just a few people go wrong. It may be that just one psychopath goes wrong, but they have the capacity to ta today to wreak enormous havoc. So what we have to do uh, the candle in the dark is to use every piece of, of knowledge and every discipline, neuroscience, social psychology, anthropology, everything, to take this problem incredibly seriously. 
So Patty mentioned the work on psychopaths. Walter and I organised a very useful conference. There's a great understanding now of the genetics of callous unemotional personality disorder, psychopathy, the, the differences in their brain activity. We need to look at this as a very serious social issue that we be, should be putting tons of resources into. Richard mentioned the issue of faith. The paper which I didn't present with Ingemar Persson raises um, the issue that maybe today we need to revisit our liberal tolerance particularly towards religion and religion in education. Maybe we need to take a much more aggressive approach to encouraging scepticism, questioning, philosophical analysis in our children, removing religion entirely from any school curriculum. Maybe we should need to, to put it into the place that we heard in the, the talk on history in terms of a much more private place outside of religion, uh, outside of society. So we need to look at the possible avenues of dealing with this issue in the most productive way. We need to use science, a broad range of sciences, but science will be the answer, not religion. And I think that's the candle in the dark. Do you want to have a respond to that, Roger? Would you uh, mind standing for a I'm just, John is telling me. Uh, By the way, it's yes. just John Booth, who's been doing an amazing job rushing around for everybody. So, four round of applause for John, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I disagree with what was just said by Julian, actually, because I do feel that it's important that religion be kept in the public sphere, that we argue about it rationally. I don't believe that faith is just faith. It's always faith in something. Now, Richard may think there isn't good evidence, but there is people who believe, believe they have some evidence, believe they have reasons. Other people can say, no, they're bad reasons, and that's why they're atheists. But then one can have a rational discussion about it. I think if you just say there's just faith... Faith becomes subjective. You can't actually be an atheist and deny it. There's nothing left to deny, and there's nothing left to argue about. And I think that's dangerous. You just push it in a corner. Uh, we all actually ought to uh, actually be able to talk in public, even in schools, and, and I think instead of just putting one's uh, foot on it and say we're not going to allow that discussion, and then things will fester, and goodness knows what will happen. Could, could I say something on that? Yes. yes. Well, I think it's <laughs> I, I, I do agree that, that religion needs to be taught in schools in the form of comparative religion. Uh, children need to be taught about religion, um, and that includes the dangers of it, uh, and they need to be taught there are people called Christians who believe this and Muslims who believe that. What is actually wicked, evil, is taking a tiny child and saying, you are a Catholic child or you are a Muslim child, you are going to a madrasa, you are going to a Catholic school. That is wicked because that is, it's, it's divisive as various people have said, it is imposing on a child who's too young to know what its opinions are going to be, opinions which are different from opinions of different groups. It's arbitrary what kind of school a particular child is sent to, it depends upon its parents' preferences um, very often. And I, I do I think I agree with with Julian, that if we could find a way which didn't seem too, uh, what shall I say, fascistic, too, too, but too, too bossy, um, yeah, to, um, to, uh, to say one of, the, one of the fundamental rights of a child is not to be indoctrinated, um, but rather a child should be taught how to think, not what to think. A child should be, should be taught to evaluate um, claims on the basis of evidence and not told, you're a Catholic, therefore you believe, you believe so and so. Now, as for, for Rogers saying that people of faith believe um, because they have reason for that faith, that means that it's evidence. There must be some evidence. Otherwise, it ceases to be, otherwise it's, it's just not, not faith. I mean, if, if it's faith, there is no evidence for it. That's what, that's what faith means. If you've got some evidence for your beliefs, let's hear it. Don't just say, that's my faith and, 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 and it's mine. Um, there has to be some reason to believe it. If, if you are claiming that there, that there is reason. I'm delighted to hear it. But then it counts as evidence. It's not faith anymore. So if I, I'll come back to you in a second. I, I was just noticing as I came into the country about a week ago, um, standpoint, the man delusion. Melanie Phillips says we've lost touch with God and reason, right? I mean, this is just. Philosophy now, um, is God really dead? Whole issue here. So the philosophers are obviously having a big go at this. The Philosopher's Magazine, Beyond the New Atheism. But in Discover Magazine, um, 
There's a piece in here which is funded by the Templeton Foundation, in which a number of people are asked the following question. Does moral action depend on reasoning? I picked this out because of the point you've just made. And there are responses from uh, Rebecca Newberger Goldstein, who says yes and no happily, uh, from Joan Lair, who says not so much, from Antonio Damasio, who says yes and no, and so on and so forth. So, so um, uh, one from... Uh, uh, one from Josh Green, who says less than it should. So, the, plainly, the Templeton Foundation is very concerned to, to answer some of these questions. Let me ask you, does moral action depend on reasoning? Well, of course, it depends often in, in, in trying to assess a situation and to figure out what the consequences would be of a certain plan as opposed to another plan. Um, so, so often there are calculations of those kind that play into it. I mean, at least for those um, moral decisions that are not just intuitively obvious. So that if we think about the question regarding whether um, non-combatants who volunteer, voluntarily become human shields, and the question is whether they should be uh, in the line of fire or not, that's an issue where you have to sort of take your time and merely consulting intuitions is probably not enough. But I mean, Owen, I think, really has, has done a very beautiful thing in thinking about these issues because someone might say, well, you know, if there isn't a God to go to for the answer and there isn't a platonic heaven to go to for the answer and there aren't any exceptionless absolute rules that apply under all conditions and we can't address those for the answer, where do we go? And, and Owen says, you go to the world which I take him to mean, and correct me on this, but which I take him to mean that when the answer isn't just obvious, you have to understand the history of it, you have to understand how other people looked at it, you talk to people with, uh, who you regard as reasonable and wise and fair-minded, and you do the best you can. Now, you might end up lamenting that there isn't a platonic realm where you could go to for the platonic truth. But, I mean, if, you know, that's the reality. I mean, it's like feeling sad that there is no absolute downness. Well, you know, that's the breaks. There is no absolute downness, and you just live with that. And I don't find that I miss absolute downness terribly. Yeah, this is... Um one of the things that I am, have been very interested in is, um, and I talked about this here, are antecedent traditions prior to, uh, we're, we are very used to there being um, religious traditions, and there are many people who say religious traditions are necessary um, to ground a morality. And what I've been struck by is, uh, uh, this is one of the luxuries of being a philosopher, going back to something like reading Aristotle. Um, Aristotle was, I think Patty said this in her talk, Aristotle uh, was a naturalistic philosopher. There were antecedent traditions. There were, uh, there were lessons that the elders had taught about how to be a good person and to be, uh, think through one's, uh, being a member of a society who was thoughtful, had practical knowledge, was critical, uh, a critical citizen. And, um, I think that things have gone backwards, uh, in the West at least, uh, because of the fact that we built uh, certain institutions with the rise of uh, uh, Christianity especially, that um, did start to um, try to motivate, now this, this came up in the conference, tried to motivate moral conformity through um, uh, theological stories that were allegedly highly motivating because of uh, the extraordinary power of the carrots and the sticks on offer but were frankly quite preposterous. And, uh, and I agree with, uh, with um, what Richard says about these kinds of theories are extraordinarily dangerous because they provide, as he put it, logical pathways such that if you really believe in these crazy stories, if you really believe, and some people do, and we only need a small number of people who believe in them, these provide logical pathways of, for taking actions of a sort that are genuinely anti-humane, and I mean in the most severe sense, the severe sense that um, Julian uh, uh, was talking about, um, uh, where uh, it could be the end of things as we know it. And, uh, 
How, how many of you, um, may I ask, how many of you actually consider yourself to be religious or go to church? Or, oh, those are two different things, I suppose. But how many of you actually go to church? On regular, right. And how many, how many of you regard yourself as being religious in any sense? Right. Interesting. So, um, did you want to come back to Richard, by the way, Roger? On, on the yeah, yeah, so there's just one, one thing I wanted to uh, I wanted to just go back on to, the, I think, the very important point about children, about a child not being b born a Catholic child, a Muslim child. Uh, and obviously, a lot of Catholics and Muslims believe that. Muslims particularly, they think you're born a Muslim, you stay a Muslim, you can't change your faith. Now, that strikes me as being actually a very Protestant view. And you see it at its extreme, perhaps not extreme, but it, it's most emphatic with Baptists who believe in believers' baptism, not infant baptism for that reason. So I think you're just betraying your Protestant background there. I don't care if I'm betraying my project. No, 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 but, therefore, I mean, but therefore, it's not a point against religion. It's a point against some forms of religion. That's all I'm saying. Well, um, I think it's a point against society's willingness to label a child with the religion of its parents. And time and again, you will see a reference to Catholic children, Protestant children, Muslim children, etc. And, and um, it's the whole of society buys into that terminology in a way that and the moment I'd mention the possibility of postmodernist children or, 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 or whatever else I said, existentialist ch children, everybody gets it. I mean, they immediately see how preposterous that is. And yet society as a whole meekly goes along with the fiction that children are allowed to be labeled with the religious beliefs of their parents. I think that's evil. Yes, it's not something I've come across. I mean, I come across Protestant parents, Catholic parents, but I wouldn't think that I would necessarily Can't. think the children, therefore, are that. Well, uh, I'm, I'm astonished. I mean, I, I, I just, um, I, I sort of feel we must be moving in a, in a different world. Or just. So, I, I, when I mentioned the thing about Templeton, do you, would, may I speak to you guys? Sure. So, I, I just came back from a meeting in San Francisco, and I spent a lot of time with Barnaby Marsh, who was uh, Templeton person as well. So I asked him about these, the, 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 the ads that you guys are doing. Um, and, and those are very interesting. I'm just wondering if you, I, could you, I can, I, I'm tethered. Oh, I'm tethered. Is there, is there some sort of official position on what the strategy is? I'm just curious. Well, well if, I'll just introduce myself. Yes, quickly, please first do. First of all, and say, um, so my name's Michael Murray, and I, my background is in academic philosophy. I've been teaching philosophy for 20 years. And uh, I've just recently uh, began working with the foundation to develop a portfolio of grant making in the domain of philosophy. So of course it's relevant to some of the concerns that have been raised here. And um, so the question specifically about the advertorial, is that the idea? Well, I will say I had some hand in putting together the particular question and picking the people who um, uh, provided the pieces because I think it's a really interesting question at the intersection of science and ethics right now. There's a lot of work being done by people like I mean, as was mentioned, uh, people like Josh Green and Mark Hauser and so on. And I think s some of that work seems to show that, indeed, uh, reasoning doesn't play as big a role in moral action as, um, as the folk might believe. And so I think it raises this interesting question and, and begins to, I hope, uh, I mean, f for me personally, the goal of being involved in this endeavor, in, uh, as I am right now, uh, is to try to do the sort of thing that Richard's commending. And I think that is uh, trying to raise the question of whether or not and to what extent um, religious belief is susceptible to, uh, um, to rational inquiry. I mean, what we should do is ask the question whether or not these things can be adjudicated by, on the grounds of reason, uh, rather than uh, trying to marginalize them on the one hand or trying to encourage uh, those who are part of religious traditions to hide behind the, the label of faith. And uh, I mean, there are a number of different conceptions of faith that have been defended in the different religious traditions. And I think actually very few of them um, would uh, correspond to the notion of faith that Richard was talking about. I mean, there are, uh, that is, they wouldn't say that faith means believing just without evidence. Uh, they would say, I mean, there are a number of different ways of parsing it out. That's just one. And I think that it's, that's a vicious one and one that should be avoided. Yeah, so, so last year's um, prize winner was Francisco Ayala, right? This year, correct. Uh, this year, yeah. So would, would Richard make a good candidate for an award? <laughs> <laughs> would you, what, would what, you accept what, it? I mean, what, you... what would be an example of, a, of an article of faith which had evidence backing it? <laughs> 
That well, could it depends go on Roger. what you mean by an article of faith. So here's an article of faith. Um, there is an omniscient, omnif uh, uh, omnipotent, omnibenevolent creator. Does that count as an article of faith? Yes. I mean, okay. Yeah. So the question is, could there be evidence for such a thing as that? Is there evidence? It would be well, very difficult evidence? to find conclusive evidence, but at least that's a proposition which has some kind of reality in the world of science. Either there sure, is right. a I supernatural agree. creator or there isn't. That's a real scientific question. I absolutely agree. So here's one place where I differ with Francisco Ayala and many other places as well. I don't pick the Templeton Prize when there, or actually have anything to do with it. But um, uh, I do think that, that you, uh, not only that you might be able to, but I think some people have made an interesting case that if we're going to infer to the best explanation with respect to a broad range of phenomena that we encounter, some of, the, some of it is empirical phenomena, some of it isn't. And I think some of the issues we've been talking about here with respect to ethical normativity, uh, I don't think they really are scientific questions that we can resolve in that way. I think there's a different domain, there are different standards of reasoning in that domain, but in any case, you look at this broad range of phenomena, and I think a good case can be made that when you infer to the best explanation, there are reasons to think that the universe had a creator, that there is uh, some evidence that the universe is fine-tuned and that, that a teleological explanation well, then that's that evidence and not faith. Oh, and, and I absolutely agree with you. It could be, it could be good you. evidence for all I right. know. I, mean, I, I absolutely agree, agree with you. So mm -hmm. you might say, okay. well, what, then, then what, what I mean by faith, right, that would be different from just believing on the basis of reason. If I want to admit a category of faith, what does that look like? Right? And I think then, we're talking about dictionary definitions of words then. Well, we are, and I think that's why we should just stop talking about that. We should just say that, um, that religious individuals have these beliefs and they, they right. have to abide by the epistemological that's standards fine. that everyone else we're, does. We're just talking semantics, but then I'm going to say that when, when, I use a sen when I use the word faith in a sentence, like when I say faith is dangerous, what I mean is belief without evidence. That may not be what other people mean by faith, but I will rephrase it. Belief without evidence is dangerous. Okay. I agree. You should know one thing, though. In the domain of epistemology, and, and the other philosophers can weigh in insofar as they choose to, this um, issue of evidentialism, that is, whether it's the case that every belief requires evidence in order to be rationally believed, is highly contested. And I, in fact, I, I'll tell you, the majority of people in epistemology, the majority of which are not religious believers, would say that the answer is no. Now, it's a technical no. They mean certain things by it, but it's not, the answer to the question of whether or not rational belief requires evidence is not obvious. And I'm telling this not as someone who works at the Templeton Foundation or somebody who's a religious believer, but just as someone who knows a lot about what's going on in epistemology. So that, I mean, that might trouble everyone, but there are actually good reasons for saying that about the nature of justification. So I think Julian had something else you wanted to say, right? I just wanted to return to this question you about... Just maybe get to stand up or Sorry, something. Um, I just wanted to return to the question you asked about the relationship between reason and morality, and you cited Damasio and I think Hauser, etc. And I think it's important to distinguish between two, two senses of morality here. Um, there's an empirical question that scientists such as these people can answer, and that is to what degree does, do people employ reasoning in their ordinary moral decisions? That's just a question of the role of reason in ordinary moral discourse. And it may well be very limited, as these people say. But the more important question is what, how should we define morality and what should be the place of reason in that and how should we try to inculcate that in our children? That's a more normative question that scientists like Damasio, etc., have a very limited impact on. And when it comes to that question, I think Richard's answer is exactly correct. What we want in our children is the capacity to reason better, to be more critical, to be able to logically identify fallacies and mistakes, but also to have a stable and agreed set of values, like the importance of equality, of tolerance, etc. So what we want are more moral children, and it may well be that the fate of humanity rests on that. But I don't think that will be a part of, of having more moral children, that they will have any particular set of faith commitments or any particular set of religious commitments. So that's the question that I think is on offer. And I don't think Damasio and Hauser, et cetera, can, can have a great thing, a deal to say about that. Yeah, so Pat, do you want to say something? Yeah, there is, I think, another issue that, that's related to the worries that Julian has. And that is that in some of the experimental literature bearing upon moral decision making, and I'm here thinking of both Josh Green and, um, and Mark Hauser,
depends on taking very, very simple kinds of ostensibly moral issues. And then, you know, putting someone in the scanner, for example, or measuring uh, what, what people over vast areas of the globe would respond to. So the favorite one, I mean, the trolley, the trolley experiments, for example, whether you should, uh, whether I should push the, the fat man onto the trolley to prevent five people uh, from being killed, or whether I should not push anybody uh, and, uh, and let them be killed. Um, it, it's so underdescribed, so oversimplified, and so easily contextualized to get completely different answers that I don't think it's a very interesting result. And Mark Hauser has a similar problem with some of his examples. So for it, it, one of his favorites goes like this. Would you find it disgusting to drink fresh apple juice out of a brand new bedpan? Most people say yes. And he takes this to show that there is a kind of universal response uh, to, a, well, a sort of moral issue. And the universal response is discussed. And so we're supposed to all, the thought is that this really reflects our moral grammar, as he calls it, following Chomsky. Well, it's an interesting thought, except that we all know that under certain kinds of conditions, of course you would do that. So there I am in the desert, desperately thirsty, and oddly enough, along comes a camel strapped to his back, is a brand new bedpan filled with, with apple juice. Would I drink it? Of course I would drink it. Not only that, but there are contexts in which people drink their own and others' urine and sweat. I mean, we know this happened, for example, in the black hole of Calcutta. And those few men who managed to survive that terrible ordeal were those who did drink their own sweat and that of others in their own urine and so forth. So part of the difficulty that I have with th assessing the degree to which reason is involved and emotion is involved is that many of these scenarios that are used in an experimental context to address this are so oversimplified, so lacking in a frame, uh, that, they're, that they really border on, on the meaningless. And so I think we need to be terribly careful about drawing really interesting conclusions from the work that has been done so far, for example, uh, in, in the trolley problem. And the, the other difficulty with the Damasio work is that at this stage, when, when some of these patients who are frontal fail to give, uh, fail to do the appropriate thing, we don't know whether that's because they fail to have the right emotional cue, although that is what Antonio Damasio thinks, or whether they're just impulsive. And the particular test that he uses to determine this, namely the Iowa gambling test, is actually completely ambiguous as between whether the person is not getting the appropriate emotional signal or whether they're just impulsive or both or neither. Can I just make one quick point? I thought that um, I want to ask Richard something or just suggest. I think Richard just uh, lowered his epistemic standards too quickly. I think that <laughs> the, I, I had no idea that Richard would suggest that a proposition like that there's an all good, all loving, an omni this, an omni that God was, uh, forget about whether it's faith or not, is rational. It seems very, very clear. I mean, this is about inference to the best explanation that the only reason that someone could hold a belief like that is because of tradition, not because there are any good arguments that there could be such a thing. I just think the, uh, it's pretty clear where the, uh, if one were to ask for reasons, so, so we need to say propositions for which there are no good reasons. Yeah, yeah, is, are I, the I kind didn't. of beliefs we ought not to uh, no, no, I have. didn't for a moment wish to say they were good reasons. I, I just wanted to say that something like the fine-tuning argument is at least an argument. It's at least a reason, and then, OK, thank you. But yeah. of course, it's <laughs> certainly true that in America, and I know this because I teach you know, basic courses in philosophy, many students will say they don't believe in, in God because of any of the arguments. 
they have faith. And what they mean is exactly what yep. you said. And that is, it just comes as an inner conviction uh, that's absolutely unmovable and, and uh, without any sort of susceptibility to reason. It is what makes them what they are and blah de blah de blah And many of them mean exactly what you said. Kenneth Miller, who is one of the leading um, opponents of intelligent design, one of the best advocates of evolution in, in America, I once asked him, why do you then, but why do you believe in, in Roman Catholicism, which he does? He said, Richard, there's a reason it's called faith. Yes. That, was, that was the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, so one of the reasons, the reason I started uh, some of this by, by asking about the neuroscience was not to sort of push buttons and sort of become hugely reductionistic. It, was to, it seems to me that if you're, if you're going to actually talk about these sorts of issues, you're probably doing it with some sort of a model of the mind in mind. And what that model is, whether it's massively modular, Fodor-esque or f psych esque or what it is, seems to will, will, will determine what your, what your answers are going to be. So, and I think that's a neuroscience story. So that, that was where I was going. But you, you had a question well, I was just or a statement. Pick up a bit on the thing about faith. Um, Do you have faith? I guess the answer might be yes. <laughs> uh, but, I'm, but I'm not offering an introspective answer. Um, I, uh, I think that I'm picking up on the point made behind me about epistemology. Uh, I think if you come out with stuff about um, uh, faith is belief without evidence and belief without evidence is bad and so on, you do ignore a, a, a great deal of um, material in epistemology in contemporary and late ph earlier philosophy which raises the uh, deep questions about how we can justify our fundamental uh, epistemological orientation to the world. Uh, so that, uh, you know, we believe all sorts of things on the basis of perception and inference, uh, inductive inference and so on. And as Hume and others have pointed out, if you press all this far enough, uh, the reasons run out. And we're just stuck with uh, these basic orientations to belief, all these basic beliefs in many cases, um, without what looks like a standard evidential path. And uh, similarly with morality. I mean, if you get down to something like uh, suffering is bad, uh, then you reach a sort of rock bottom. But it doesn't follow from any of that that reason disappears altogether, because there's a whole lot of ways of responding to these uh, issues in epistemology by way of offering what look like benign circular arguments on behalf of some of these basic things, uh, offering various other sorts of considerations which are not proofs of them at all but which are part of a sort of rational exercise. Now the interesting thing about religious faith is whether it actually can be seen on a continuum with that. And that's a controversial question. Uh, and that's a question that you know really I think needs to be uh, properly investigated rather than starting with uh, the sort of position that Richard was foreshadowing before, endorsing before, that anything that just looks like it's a belief that isn't backed up by a standard evidence pattern uh, got to be dismissed. Um, and of course the, this, this fits with the idea that faith is supposed to be a form of trust. But it doesn't rule out the fact that it's uh, reason it's open to reasoning about and argument for and of course can be rejected as a result of all sorts of evidential things uh, including one things that show that it's a bad thing on the education of children uh, uh, I, I, I agree with uh, Roger I mean I, I, I don't actually know and again this may be my circle of uh, uh, you know buffet uh, Christians or something, as uh, Walter was calling them. Uh, I don't know any of my uh, friends who raise their kids in this, you know, indoctrin... I, I'm happy to have indoctrination on board. Indoctrinating way. Uh, they don't just give them logic, mind you. I mean, you can't bring anyone up that way. You've got to give them beliefs. Uh, but the question is how uh, rigid you are in the control of those beliefs and how much you try to enforce a sort of conformity to them. And most of the religious people I know who bring up their children, uh, let them know they believe various things about the resurrection of Christ or whatever it is, and uh, th this is you know, something they're going to pray about and all that sort of thing. Uh, and then they let the kids get on with thinking about it in their own way. And the results of this can be 
uh, disastrous from their point of view. Uh, both my sons are atheists. And I think, what have I done? This is what happens with buffet Catholicism. Uh, uh, I don't know. But, uh, uh, but I regarded that as a kind of happy outcome in the sense that they are tolerant atheists. I wish there were more of them in this room. Uh, thank you. Yes. Could I reply to that? Perhaps that you should. Roger. No, Richard, let me reply to you. And then, then we'll go. Just a quick. Um, well, no, do you want to reply, Richard? Well, I, 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 I can reply. Um, I, I just want to make, I mean, there is a distinction between whether people, as a matter of fact, indoctrinate their ch children. I'm quite happy to accept that your friends don't, don't do that. I was not talking about that, although it could be investigated, and I think you'll find lots of people do. But, but it's a separate question whether, whether society as a whole accepts the labeling of children as Catholic children or Protestant children. And there is a very widespread tendency for that. I mean, you see newspapers in Northern Ireland, you see pictures of children on the way to school. It's labelled Catholic children being stoned on the way to... This is what's wrong with the media. I mean, the media similarly says the Catholic position on abortion, the Catholic position on whatever. And, and I produce evidence to show that's not the Catholic position. You know, whatever it is about what the Vatican utters on the thing. Well, good. That's, that's misperception by uh, the media. Well, but... Uh, uh, <laughs> You're, you, if I may and say so, you. are very I mean. enlightened, but, but, um, <laughs> but, I mean, it, but the phrase Catholic child or Muslim child is remarkably ubiquitous. I mean, can anybody seriously deny but that? that's related to ethnicity. I mean, that is very much related to ethnicity. I mean, people want to say something like, don't be hostile to Muslim children. Now, that's a perfectly intelligible thing for them to say, and it's not, it doesn't contain a, 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 an ingredient saying, they are never to be allowed out of that box. Well, I, I wish they'd say, don't be hostile to children and Muslim parents. Right. Oh, well, all right. I'm, so, I'm, quick comment there. It's a big difference. Over. Well, I, I don't want to get into detail. You, you, you'll have to hike. Just a this, quick uh, comment to uh, Pat's last remark. I, I th you know, I, I, having taught for a long time, I've seen the same thing, right? You uh, talk to uh, college students about their religious beliefs and you ask them what the reasons are, and for the most part, they don't have any to offer, and so they'll just hide behind this label that they call, that they call faith, which for them means they really don't have any reason for believing what they believe. That doesn't necessarily mean they're not entitled to believe it. And in fact, in many cases, we believe things on the basis of other people's say so because we think that they're authorities in the, in the relevant regard. So, I mean, to just take some of the issues we've been talking about here with respect to things like tolerance or belief in, uh, in, in human rights or intrinsic moral worth. I bet if you pressed most of the people in the audience here, I mean, the way philosophers do when we do serious philosophy, to defend their beliefs in those things, they would bottom out pretty quickly as well. Now, that doesn't mean nobody has the goods. That doesn't mean nobody in the, in the domain of ethics has done the hard work to come up with an account. Uh, perhaps they have, and perhaps other people in the room would be willing to defer to them when they got to that point. So, but what's important here is that somebody better have the goods, right, when it comes to these, somebody better have the goods. So even these individuals who hide behind faith, if may, perhaps this is what they mean, it's a deference to authority. That's okay, as long as somebody out there is doing the hard work. So Steve is anxious to open, or is, I, I think that was a pop, he's anxious to open wine bottles, so just a couple more things. He obviously wants to get some red wine into for your health. The resveratrol works very well. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Well, quite independent of the question of whether <clears throat> uh, all those who accept religious propositions do so without evidence, uh, or and independent of the question of whether there are certain kinds of propositions which are justifiable to accept without empirical evidence, um, I would like to say that um, clearly, uh, and independent of whether lots of people do, clearly many religious people uh, embrace propositions on faith, not only without evidence, but in defiance of evidence. And that kind of belief, uh, religious or not, leads to, can lead to frightful behaviors. Um, so my question or proposal is, um, the conference was phrased as a, as a dichotomy. Uh, does religious belief lead to tolerance or intolerance? Clearly it can and does lead to the former. And uh, my suggestion is that the more interesting question is, is an ecological question. Under what circumstances does religious belief lead to intolerance? And I'd just like to throw out uh, two empirical examples of this. One involves a complexity in how we measure or conceive of intolerance. So for example, 
Uh, and I think that the superheading of the conference was religious conflict. So in the Western tradition, the, the Christian tradition that uh, is the most deeply committed to nonviolence and pacifism are the Anabaptist traditions, and in particular, Old Order Mennonites and Amish. So uh, by one measure, um, they are the least inclined to conflict, uh, and particularly violent conflict. On the other hand, um, they're probably the most uh, intolerant and in-groupish of all the, the Christian traditions. Uh, with respect to every variable we mentioned today, homosexuality, uh, the role of women, the role of other religious traditions, the role of other ethnic traditions, even the role of other languages. So um, suggestion one is that we need to be more complex in terms of how we uh, measure and consider uh, conflict and intolerance. And suggestion number two is there's a time in uh, parasitology when the reigning wisdom was the longer association a parasite had with its host, the less virulent it is. Now we might think that about religion, but uh, there, in, in fact, we don't think that about parasites anymore either, that there's a trade-off between transmissivity and virulence. And an ecological question about religion is, does the same trade-off exist? Um, so uh, are more readily transmissible religions um, in some way more virulent? Back to the Amish uh, example, by the way, that's one of the least transmissible religious tradition. It's the slowest growing. Uh, so two comments. All right, thank you. Um, unless there's anybody with an absolutely pressing comment, uh, let me ask, uh, do, Julian, do you want to sort of wrap this up? Uh, do you want to say what a wonderful maybe, day it's been? Maybe and how, Steve would like to Steve, kind of summarize the, perhaps you'd like the stream to. of the conference. Well, it's My work been, here is done. <laughs> it has been an absolutely fantastic conference, and we've been very lucky to uh, have so many great speakers and commentators, and very lucky also to have Professor Dawkins um, come in at the last minute with uh, a summary and very lucky to be able to have this uh, fantastic panel discussion. So um, it's the icing on the cake on the icing on the cake. And the third bit of icing on the cake is we have some drinks in the next room. Um, and I think we've got about 45 minutes to drink them before uh, they're gonna start throwing us out of the building. So let us enjoy ourselves.